Nicholas Hirsch is an architect based in Frankfurt and, as many of you uh, will know, has taught as a unit master here at the AA. His recent book, On Boundaries, presents reflections on a body of projects that verge on the disciplines of visual and performative arts. Recent collaborations with artists Rack Media Collective on the Cyber Mahala Cultural Hub uh, and the ongoing collaborative project United Nations Plaza, which is a model for a school which was originally uh, <coughs> planned for Manifesto 6, which was canceled in Nicosia, fuses both an ap academic research as an educational uh, space and a physical practice as a real building in Berlin. Niklas, together with Wolfgang Lorch and Marcus Miesen, is one of the winners of the Great Pyramid's uh, architectural competition. Ingo Nermann is a novelist and a freelance writer living in Berlin. His most recently published books include uh, The Cur Curious World of Drugs and Their Friends and The Great Pyramid. He is the editor of the series Solutions, which is published by Sternberg Press uh, and uh, is a series which invites authors to propose uh, a series of ideas for a specific region uh, or country. The idea of the Great Pyramid first appeared in Ingo Nermann's 2006 book Umbauland, which showed ten ideas for radical reform in Germany. The ninth idea was for a German wonder of the world, a tomb for potentially every human being to be built in a specifically economically depressed region of East Germany. The spatial requirements for what became an architectural competition were determined by the calculation that the ashes of all people currently living would occupy a pyramid of a height of 700 feet and a base of 1,000 feet. In proposing this monument for all of us, this world wonder addressed our kind of uh, ideas of death. And there are two responses which are in the solutions book, which I quite liked. One is, so outlandish is this proposal that, even, that it even caught the attention of famous architects. And the second was, I think it's a money-making scamish, but I also think it's pretty damn cool. And so tonight, uh, to present one of the pro architectural proposals and the story from which the project came is Nicholas Hirsch and Ingo Nermann. Um, yeah, my, um, um, so I'm by profession I'm a writer, not not, uh, and in a way I, there was never really in, in relation to architecture. Uh, for for many years I thought architecture is the only thing I can be sure of that it's of no interest for me. I was very arrogant against architecture; thought somehow I could ignore it. Uh, and the same is the case with pyramids. I uh, have absolutely no, yeah, I'm absolutely not attracted by pyramids at all. Um, so, yeah, so, um <coughs> and now I, 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 will, I will combine reading two texts, but I hope you don't realize that they are two. Um, one is um, a part of the introduction of this uh, book um, uh, about the pyramid. Um, Solution nine. Uh, solution nine is is not that as mysterious ad, as it might appear. Um, this book uh, is part of a series of books uh, called Solution. Um, it's the first one, uh, but um, they all have numbers. Uh, so, so solutions on how to improve the world. Um, and. It's published by Sternberg Press in New York and Berlin, and um, I'm editing it, and uh, Zach Heiss is, is doing the graphic design. Um, and this is solution number nine because it's part of a, it's like a single of, of another book, of like of an album uh, called Umbauland, like uh, reconstruct, uh, Reconstruction Nation. Uh, it's a book on Germany and how to improve Germany. And I did it, uh, I wrote it a couple of years ago in 2005. It was published in Germany. And it will be as well part of this series as Solution 1 to 10 by the end of the year. Um, so, I'm, and I'm reading the chapter, I'm combining parts of the chapter of this book on the Great Pyramid and of the introduction. So, um, yeah. <coughs> Mankind 
transforms the planet Earth, of that which can be seen with the naked eye from outer space, little remains but smog and light. Even still, human beings cannot move mountains. They have long had much more mind-boggling things to do. They continue to erect ever greater buildings, but have ceased to be astonished by them. The monument has become an investment to be paid off in a matter of years. Monumental is at best the alluring facade, while the inside is for gambling, selling, sleeping or working under comparatively niggling circumstances. When Jens Thiel told me in 2005 about the scenario he had discussed with artist Eric Needling, one that involved building a massive, enormous pyramid in stagnating Eastern Germany to ensure a la New Deal, a symbolic and tangible economic boost, I was skeptical at first. Construction processes have become so automated that the long-term unemployed would hardly stand to benefit. Also, the question as to whether an artificial hill like that could attract enough visitors as to result in hotels and amusement parks before finally becoming a world-class tourist attraction like Las Vegas, Disneyland or Bilbao seemed iffy to me. Don't the Egyptian pyramids only seem so imposing because they are sitting on a flat plain? How modest would they look in front of a low European mountain range, range not to mention the Alps? Then it occurred to me that the new Great Pyramid, just like its ancient predecessors, could be conceived as a tomb. But rather than a single exclusive burial chamber, each stone would be a grave. This pyramid is potentially any human being's grave. As monumental as it's affordable, it serves those of all nationalities and religions. Stone for stone, it grows with every burial. Rather than harsingly burying one another or allowing our ashes to be scattered, as a small stone in the pyramid we can remain part of our species constantly shifting and ever expanding to blow. Thus, the pyramid could become the largest structure in human culture, but would at the same time be a monument of modesty, a monument to one another since every stone would be the same size and its position determined at random and to humankind as a whole, because even if every individual alive today were to be buried in this great pyramid, it would still be dwarfed by the biggest mountains in the world. The first stones might be arranged in the form of a small pyramid, which would then be successively enlarged. This construction project is a new Tower of Babel, reuniting the scattered people in death. To non-believers, burial in this monument holds out the hope that they will outlast humankind at least as ashes and bones embedded in stone. Actually, only ashes. There was a first idea it could be bones too, but uh, uh, I think just ashes is easier. Um, there's no way for anyone to influence the distribution of the stones in order to secure a prominent position. The pyramid is a monument to equality, but as such, also part of the market. For the first time, a burial site solicits human remains on an international scale. Market globalization has finally created a competition even for dead bodies. Humanitarian organizations offer sponsorships in order to pay for the transportation and burial uh, of poor people and travel for their relatives. The pyramid can be highly profitable even if the space Boyern is sold cheaply or given away for free. It attracts visitors not only because it is the biggest building and continues to grow. Millions of people come every year to see their own potential burial site or the graves of family members. Churches and spiritual communities 
from all over the world open representations and organize funeral services which require a great number of musicians, choristers and priests. Luxury source offer direct views of the pyramid as a, at a distance from the tourist crowds. The area becomes popular with retirees who move there on purpose to await their death. Drugs, chants, meditations and especially composed music allow them to shape their transition to make it as gentle or as, a, as abrupt as desired. In the past, much technical innovation has been driven by the military, that is to say, by the purpose of wanton killing. Now a branch of research flourishes that is devoted to natural or voluntary death. With the spectacular structure serving as a catalyst, Germany in its entirety could be transformed into a gi gigantic retirement home and hospital. The climate is relatively mild, epidemics are rare, German culture is highly renowned, the cities of East Germany have already been carefully restored, and thanks to the welfare state and a low birth rate, crime figures continue to be relatively low. The service industries that spring up around the pyramid, as well as the labor-intensive elderly and hospital care sectors, can significantly reduce unemployment in Germany. Giving the aging of the population another push creates additional employment opportunities for both highly qualified and untrained workers. The more expensive Germany will become as a consequence, the more elderly Germans will emigrate to low-wage countries where a modest pension or the sale of their German property is still enough to afford them a comfortable <coughs> lifestyle. The first great migration of the elderly begins. Indian and Chinese retirees take possession of Germany while German retirees make room for them by moving to the tourist paradises of southern Europe, places which, with which they are familiar from younger days even though the Sahara is now gobbling them up. In, contradict, uh, in contradistinction to a hole in the ground or a crude tumulus, the strictly geometrical and very stable pyramid is an icon of civilization. Architects from neoclassicism to postmodernism have mercilessly quoted is, it as such, be it covered with lawn in the park of Branitz, that's in Germany, for a hotel and casino in Las Vegas, or as a foyer of a furniture discounter. The, na the Nazis did not build any pyramids. Their industry of annihilation was structures in and around barracks, and the heroes honored by their four antique monuments were buried on battlefields and ordinary cemeteries. Nonetheless, the plan to build a gigantic pyramid for use as a mass grave in Germany may give rise to somber associations. There's only one thing to be done, to build and see. Um, so, and this is uh, where it comes in that I, as a writer, suddenly, yeah, became, yeah, doing something that is not really writing, but something else. Together with the structural engineer and transport planner Heiko Holzberger, me and Jens Thiel founded the society Friends of the Great Pyramid and successfully applied for money from the German Federal Cultural Foundation's Future of Labor Fund. The about 60,000 pounds, or 70,000 pounds now, uh, as uh, yeah, the, it's not that much worth anymore. So 70,000 pounds that we were awarded would have to be enough to carry out the first constructional, industrial, and economic analysis, find a possible location, introduce the proje project in multiple full-length presentations, and be accompanied by a film crew. Testing the idea developed an overwhelming dynamic. Jens Thiel convinced us that not only graves but also simple memorial stones should be allowed in the pyramid. Only then could the pyramid truly be for everyone, even long deceased or orthodox Jews and Muslims whose faith prohibits cremation and above ground burial. Jens Thiel also developed the idea of giving the pyramid a virtual counterpart.
We asked Graham Kohlhaas if he would join the jury for an urban planning competition, and he promptly said yes. He was soon followed by Omar Akbar, director of the Bauhaus Stiftung in Bauhaus uh, von yeah, in, in Dessau, Stefano Burry, uh, editor of Abitara magazine, and Mucha Prada. And brilliant architecture firms also declared their willingness to participate. In the meantime, we discovered Streets, a village in Dessau, Roslau, as a possible location for the Great Pyramid, and were met with both enthusiasm and dismay. The international press gave euphoric reports, and till now about 1,500 people from 80 countries um, reserved a stone on our website, uh, www.thegreatpyramid.org. So, and I just mentioned the architectural competition, and this is where Nicholas Hirsch comes in. Uh, we invited, we decided that we would only invite people to, to uh, so it was not an open competition. There were, f uh, and we invited four teams. One is Atelier Bauwa from Tokyo, one Mada Spam from Shanghai, then uh, Fake Design, that's the architectural um, office of uh, Artist Ai Weiwei in Beijing, and um, the, the fourth team uh, was built only, yeah, it's not an, uh, as such, it doesn't exist as a, as a company or as an office. It's uh, Nicholas Hirsch sitting next to me together with Wolfgang Lorch and Markus Miesen, whom you might know from, from teaching at the AA. Um, yes, yeah, so and uh, I'm, I'm very glad that uh, Nicholas made it to come here and uh, to present um, their contribution to the competition. Thank you. Thank you, Ingo. Um, Firstly, for um, the invitation, actually, to this uh, pyramid project and also to tonight's um, event. Um, probably our main approach was actually to connect your idea of uh, the pyramid and maybe a specific understanding of the problem of death um, with the question of urbanism. and. Um, so the, the question, to what extent does death and burying people, to what extent does this produce uh, urban conditions and urban functions and kind of uh, urban space that um, is probably something that is usually um, out of sight and something hidden. And um, what we were also looking into was um, some maybe the condition before death um, aging like the transition between life and death and um, we're looking into the problem of uh, an aging society and that's probably one of the starting points also of uh, Ingo's uh, approach in some way that uh, one of the starting points of of the pyramid and of the of um, of this concept is of course the uh, the phenomenon of an aging society, which is a kind of typical situation in uh, continental Europe, uh, at least. So, in this sense, uh, our focus was uh, something that we have named uh, geriatric urbanism, and we have actually produced for this competition. Um, kind of small book which um, is on the one hand a description of a, of a brief, the invention of a brief as a starting point for an urban development and which then um, is continued in this um, next chapter, geometric space uh, with uh, quite typical urban plans and then as a third part um, the pyramid as a as a kind of micro architecture, a structural system that is based on uh, on the concept of cremation, actually uh, put forward by uh, Ingo Niemann and Jens Thiel. So I would, um, what I'm going doing, going to do now is to uh, go through this um, little book that we have produced for the competition, and you will see part of that in the 
new book uh, launched by uh, uh, Sternberg Press. So regarding the, the brief for such an urban zone between life and death, um, we of course looked primarily or as a starting point into the, uh, the problem of an aging society um, where the demographics have completely changed. But today one can also see that actually uh, from this sort of classical pyramid model, it's also quite interesting that if we talk about demographics, we are actually quite close to the pyramid again. And um, here we see in the current situation, or in a few years, uh, in uh, 30 years approximately, we have, well, it's not an inverted pyramid, but I think the direction is quite clear. What we were interested in was that age and death are in our cities um, space, spaces um, that are actually, we know them and we uh, might know where they are located, but usually they are very much out of our um, experience of cities and uh, it's, uh, these are rather traumatized spaces for us. And very because of private experiences, maybe. But um, our question was, in a way, uh, how does a society react to a reality in which age and death shift into the center, like demographically shift into the center? How does a society organize the spaces that negotiate the dead and the living? Is it still possible to define those spaces as heterotopian? heterotopian as uh, Foucault did when he described the modern invention of hospitals, asylums, and cemeteries. Can we develop spaces that acknowledge age and death and understand them not in notions of decay, but at the trigger of urban development? So for us, the, uh, the competition or this call for ideas was uh, very much an opportunity to look into um, an urbanism that is defined by death and rather by a cult of, of youth, actually. So in that sense, we, we developed a brief for such a city, and uh, which was extremely direct. We were looking for programs. That's what uh, architects uh, often do. And um, here you see uh, part of the program. So the program could be read as a sequential logic, and it's uh, certainly a flexible storyboard of what might happen uh, in such a, such a new urban zone. So it's um, kind of brief. Um, I will come back to, to it uh, later. Pyramid is as the central piece of this program um, is the largest <laughs> component. Uh, it's a growing program. It's very much part of a process. You see that the Great Pyramid, uh, mentioned uh, in its dimension already by uh, by Ingo, um, was um, according to his um, scenario much bigger than uh, the, uh, the pyramids that we know from history, like bigger than the pyramid, the Luxor pyramid in Las Vegas, bigger than the Cheops pyramid in Gizeh, and uh, see the Great Pyramid is uh, almost 100 meters higher than that, potentially, because it's part of a growing process. So here I, I go just very quickly through such a program, and um, these are programs that also for me, as for many, are uh, um, probably spaces I don't like to remember very much because they are related to uh, rather sad moments of my life. And uh, the funeral parlor is such a, such a part of a program um, which usually you have several of them, of, of them in order to have uh, to run quite a rigid sequential logic of one funeral 
coming after the other. So it's not in parallel, but you have to switch uh, as quickly as possible. So therefore, you, you need several facilities of them. Technology becomes more and more import important uh, in today's funerals. So computer and audiovisual facilities provide a wide choice of options for funeral service memorials, uh, which today also um, include more and more live um, conferences to people or relatives who are not able to attend the memorial service. This is, might sound to some of you uh, cynical, but this is actually what's going on uh, in today's um, funeral industry, because it is an industry. Music is uh, an important part of it, and um, classical mu music is maybe what we are used to, but today um, more and more contemporary or um, 20th century music is entering the space, and uh, um, the favorite um, funeral music in Britain is My Way from Frank Sinatra. <laughs> the flower shop is um, kind of industry that has to be close to any kind of uh, cemetery and funeral service. The bereavement is important um, because it gives, oh it's a spelling mistake, here. Um, it gives uh, space for um, for a community to uh, um, to come together in a more informal way after the service. So even here, there are very rigid systems of how long such a um, coming together takes. It's one one and a half hours to two and a half hours. Then uh, the crematory. It's uh, Today, uh, usually it's a very uh, uh, ecologically correct system. Um, so because people are, of course, afraid that, the, and that there uh, are effects, uh, perverse effects on uh, air pollution, then there's a real industry uh, on in, continen in continental Europe uh, kind of uh, fight between different industry, funeral industries in and uh, burying industries in Czech Republic and Poland. Many people, mainly in Eastern Germany, um, go for um, or cremation is being done in the Czech Republic and Poland and the service then is going back to, to Germany. So there's a real distribution, spatial distribution of labor here. And uh, we see this, of course, as a facility, the crematory, that uh, could be part of such an urban space. Part of the, of the necessary facility for the pyramid uh, would be a precast concrete manufacturing, which was also already part of the, uh, the concept um, given by Ingo and Jens. So part of it is a structural logic, storage spaces, then administration, parking, TV studio, coming back to this um, issue of technology. So there's uh, today an increasing uh, space for um, TV that actually uh, refers to aging societies and death. And there is um, a new TV channel in Germany uh, that is going to be launched, uh, EOS TV, so it's uh, Die TV. And uh, so it's like mourning as something you could talk in TV. And uh, we might re reject all these issues, but um, our maybe interest also in, in the project was very much to take into account what exists today, not to reject it, but to uh, actually speculate on a situation where we take into account um, these um, new developments um, around a society which is actually um, 
changing completely through demograph demographics. And extending the, um, the issue of TV, we're looking into also the potentials of um, internet programs where you actually, via YouTube, um, where people actually interact and talk about the process of aging and almost describing their transition uh, to death. And as another um, program within this urban space, uh, there will be uh, hotels for uh, relatives, then um, also referring back to the, uh, the transition between, or dis to describe this zone between life and death, the nursing home, residence, assistant living. and uh, the home for the terminally ill. And um, for me, uh, maybe that was also one of the reasons um, why Ingo has uh, contacted me. And, um, like in my career, in, in a kind of strange way, I've started uh, my first work was um, memorial. Um, so it was about death. And a couple of years later, probably my major urban experience as an architect was when I was a student still was I, was, I did my civil service um, with um, elderly people, and this was very, very close to this issue, like to people who actually were close to death. And uh, I was kind of, it was a mobile service. I was moving from one person uh, to the next one. And um, maybe this project was also a kind of attempt to come back to this and to look at uh, those phenomenon, those phenomena in a, in a way that uh, doesn't reject um, them and to take them into account. And uh, of course an old wish by humankind is uh, actually that you can extend the moment of death and to actually freeze people. There are, um, there are these uh, new technologies, uh, Sarionics, um, which is an attempt to actually uh, freeze a human body until maybe um, scientists might have found out a possibility to uh, continue life. So this is more or less the, the program. And um, the next uh, step we did was a scale test, so also to show you the uh, the, the size actually of the pyramid and of that project. Um, we did um, here these, these scale tests with Aldo Rossi's famous um, cemetery in Modena, the King's Valley in Egypt, the Giza pyramid complex, and uh, on the left side, the, uh, the large complex um, in the east of Germany, of the, uh, the village um, that Ingo has mentioned before, or that he has sort of discovered or contacted. It's a very large, one of the largest cemeteries in Germany, in Hamburg. And um, this potential that I was quite interested in was to uh, if if we actually talk about a geriatric space or city, is this something like a theme city, like one of those cities that, uh, like the the car city uh, in Wolfsburg, Autostadt, Volkswagen, or the healthcare city in Dubai, or is it something like the Las Vegas of death? So here the, the site plan, it's a very open situation between uh, two different <coughs> small villages, Streets and Mühlstedt in eastern Germany. And here a kind of possible scenario of uh, the pyramid and its surroundings and the urban space. So the, the pyramid itself sits, according to our concept, 
in uh, in the lake because it's a kind of sandy environment. So the, all the material of the uh, for the concrete structure, um, the sand ingredients will be taken from the ground. So there's a reciprocity between the process of growth of the pyramid and uh, the kind of negative space within the existing landscape. So also the lake will increase according to the uh, growth of the pyramid and the city. And here the, uh, the program that's kind of distributed uh, around uh, the, uh, the major um, programs I've just talked about. Here the geometry, uh, axonometry, this growing process. So I just go very quickly through. Here uh, the ritual. So um, many of the of the relatives won't probably actually take into account all the necessary infrastructure of so of such a city, but um, so they will probably only realize the 10% of facilities that are actually using. But that's, that was part of the interest we had. How can you make apparent all the other 90%? So we were quite fascinated by this tension, uh, yet we don't have an answer how to actually live with it. But that was uh, not our aim. This is support structure. growth. Here you see uh, the relationship between the pyramid and the site. So it's uh, coming out, all the, the sand material for the cement and for the concrete industry comes from the ground and as the water level is quite high here, we uh, um, there will be this, this kind of new, new lake um, that will be uh, developed. And in contrary to the uh, classical pyramid, which was um, a pyramid from for one person, here it was more about um, the complexity of a new system that enhances the individuality of stones. So it was more about creating a lighter um, structural system. So it's not one, it wasn't about stones that are directly connected to each other, but it was um, about using gaps as a structural system. That's the onion scheme, so it was about working from the inside to the outside, like an, a growth system for the pyramid. And this is the process and plan, using gaps. Thank you. So, uh, shall we take questions? We have a, a microphone here, which is... I can start with a question. Uh, it, uh, one of the things that I, I was wondering if you could talk about more, Ingo, was the actual process of uh, proposing this and presenting it to the, the region in, in which you imagine the pyramid <laughs> to be uh, intended for, because uh, today we have sort of talked about the kind of uh, concept of the pyramid, but it was also intended for a very specific geographic area. <coughs> um, yeah, there was this idea to, to do it in East Germany because the economic situation there is, is pretty bad. Um, and then we started looking for, for certain areas and uh, yeah, we came, we ended up pretty soon with Dessau, which is uh, between Berlin and Leipzig. Uh, it's one hour drive from Berlin, one hour from Leipzig. They're two international airports. And it's an interesting area because um, there's the Bauhaus, or was there for, for a time. Uh, in the beginning it was in Weimar, then it moved to Dessau, then it went on. Um, and as well, there is a, um, a huge park, and it's a little bit like an English park um, called Wurlitz. 
and it was the first public park in in Germany and so and there was even there's even a, a small pyramid in this park uh, and now it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and um, we thought that it's kind of there's a similarity between opening up a park to the public and doing the same with the pyramid yeah so which wha something which used to be in royal or aristocratic privilege is now for everyone and then we we looked for a possible site within Dessau and we did it very I mean usually would do it the other way around you would l first you would look for investors and so on and then at some point you would go to a, certain, a specific site and then to tell the people okay we will build this pyramid here actually and uh, um, so hi here we are <laughs> so in this case but this case uh, and this was the whole idea of this project and of the funding as well to right from the beginning talk to people how they would react to such a proposal and um, so we, 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 found we just went to the biggest um, yeah, spot in, in, in Dessa where there was just, uh, there was just agriculture and um, uh, ver pretty flat and only two very small villages nearby inheriting 200 people. And we went to the kind of major, it's not really major, but um, uh, of this wo one village uh, uh, where this site actually belongs to called Streets. Uh, and the funny thing is, he said, oh, this is great. Yeah, we thought, okay, they will be totally skeptical, but he was really enthusiastic about it and said, this is really, I'm, he even said something, I'm totally into monuments. Um, and um, yeah, told me about his obsession with monuments, and I thought this is great. Then we talked as well with um, like the co-major, the second major woman, and she was as well totally into it for another reason, because um, in the neighbor village they had they had built a windmill, and this windmill was right at the border to their village, and now they had the problem because of the wind conditions, it was. M there was a lot of noise by this windmill because it was a very cheap one, which was actually, and this is all kind of this hatred between this very, this difficult relationship between East and West Germany. This windmill, this was at least the rumor, you could say, the conspiracy theory, was actually from Bavaria, so from West Germany. So in West Germany, people had claimed this is too loud, this windmill, but then they brought it to East Germany and thought, okay, they don't, they won't care. So they felt this this windmill from this other village is really a problem. And so they said, okay, it's great. The site we had been looking for was direct was between this windmill and the village. So they said, this is great. This mm -hmm. pyramid will be just, you know, we won't see this windmill anymore. We won't hear it. But then I said, but building the pyramid were it will be noisy too. I mean, you can't. <laughs> but she said, "No, that's no problem." But then it's our permit, you know. It's it's not the windmill from the uh, from the uh, neighboring village, uh, and at least we can really profit from it. So, and both as well saw the commercial potential. Uh, I mean, the 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 spot where this uh, would be built, and the land would become worth a lot, and and I mean, the whole area would really develop in a, in a great way. And then we did, um, okay, so they encouraged us to invite the public. Um, and we did it, and uh, it turned out to be a total disaster. Because there was one guy, and he was uh, really agitating against us in the discussion. Uh, and we didn't know who he was, and it turned out it was, again, it was a guy from another neighboring village not the one with the windmill, but another one, even smaller one, only 100 inhabitants. And they were just, the funny thing is they were envying this village. They were um, thinking, oh, they, you know, their property becomes now worth a lot, but we actually, we, we don't profit from it, so we, we are against it. Mm, I, I didn't understand in the evening, but, but, but later on, and this village <laughs> and the actual village street were were um, th there was a fusion between these two villages. So the major 
we approached first was as well the major of the other city uh, of the other village as this village was now totally against the pyramid he turned to be against the pyramid too at the same time we encountered the major of Stre of of Dessau which is the actual city and the one who is really in in, in charge i mean this major of the village it's more a symbolic job it's it you don't have any political power and he is he is totally fond of the pyramid uh, uh, he says I, I he himself has a catholic background and wants to be buried and doesn't want to be cremated but he likes the idea a lot and sees the potential for the area because it there's a total decline the uh, the city lost many inhabitants, like 20,000 people, and uh, since reunification, um, so he's kind of supporting us. And there, there, but he has no; he's not belonging to political party. Uh, so for him, it's a little bit difficult because mm, he has to sort out who, which parties are actually supporting him. So he is very kind of. It's a great idea, and so on. But the, but at the same time, saying but there's a, a the road to reality is a long one, and so at the same time supporting us, but as well trying to um, calm down the people who are upset. Um, and but now we have actual support by two parties in um, in Dessau, and uh, funnily enough, it's the the Green Ecological Party, they are totally into it, uh, and the very left-wing party, because they like the idea of this, that it's a monument of equality. Um, and there is some support as well in the more right-wing parties, but yeah, we have to sort out, and so it's really now about building coalitions in this town, and uh, yeah, it's not even that bad. Uh, what turns out to be more a problem actually is how to get to find an investor because it's it's not a typical project it's not we are building another hotel or anything or an amusement park or anything so uh, and there is nothing as I understand like startup money like uh, like venture capital yeah for a startup it doesn't really exist in the in the architectural world so um there were different approaches. One was, I mentioned it um, I, mm, very shortly in, in, in my introduction, that this idea that there will be equivalent to the actual permit in the web, like a virtual permit, so that you can actually navigate through this permit. And so there was this idea, so in a way, this actual, you could see it even the other way around, the actual permit is only an extension of the virtual permit. So we could actually get venture capital but like for for uh for a web startup uh which <laughs> is kind of promoted by an actual pyramid wh which could at some point turn out to be the biggest uh, monument yeah building in the world but um <laughs> uh but the costs are not so big in the beginning because uh we just need the foundation and then you start you start putting there a few stones and then it goes on and on um so you would need some investment in the beginning, but even even when you think of promoting it and so on, it's it's something you might need a few million, but not more. It's it's I mean for for such a for the potential of the project, it's uh, uh, it's ridiculously small amount. But so yeah, we will have to sort it out. Yeah, um, a question for um, both of you. Same question, but maybe uh, I'd like to see your two different responses. Ingo, you started by saying that um, you, the first thing you said was, I'm a writer, mm -hmm. and that who didn't have necessarily uh, much interest or knowledge even in about architecture. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether how, I find it very interesting that uh, you being a writer that has somehow, partly through design mm. and then partly through a series of other uh, accidents almost mm. along the way, find yourself surrounded by uh, an architectural project, mm. architects and so on and so forth. What has the process told you about architects and the architectural psyche that you didn't know before? And please be as brutally honest mm -hmm. as you want to be, despite 
where we are. And the second part of the question is to you, Nikolaus. How was it to work on a project whose brief was actually devised by a writer, ultimately? And I think that's very interesting. That uh, Obviously, we're used to projects like this, uh, a sort of tradition, mm -hmm. sort of Borgesian tradition almost, of, 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 uh, of dreamlike utopian architectures, but being written in fiction. I think it's very interesting that it was given as a brief, almost uh, whose tangibility is somewhere between real and, 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 and speculative, um, but that real architects, contemporary architects, would, took it on. I think it's very interesting. So it's a kind of two-part question about the relationship between a writer and an and architecture and an architect and a, and a writer. Um, I think there's a lot of, what do you say, speculative architecture. I don't know really even the, the term for it, like what archigram, uh, super school, and so on. And, and I think a lot of architects at some point in super their... Super Yeah? yeah? Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm really... No, uh, that would uh, be a great... Um, <laughs> Someone should... Yeah, so should, that's um, what we I'm really a dilettante. Um, but um, so at some point, I think, or maybe as a lot of students are doing this, for instance, they, they develop something very speculative. So it's to them, in a way, it's very familiar. But it's somehow, it's, it's, it seems to be always like a, a romantic phase in their life. This is as I see, and then, then, then reality starts. So, encountering, I, I mean, I didn't really talk ab th about it with them, but I had this impression it was like, yeah, really, uh, like if you would would try to con convince like middle-aged people of of a romantic teenage love or something like that, but but now saying no, but but now. You have the potential; it could actually become real. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's a strange, uh, strange allegory, but mm, so yeah, it's 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 it's. And I I, I, I spoke with with Ram Kohlhaas a lot about it too, because he actually now is building a lot, and and then but it's all about the clients and what they want. So you you try to to get freedom in that but y it's strange that that architects don't do it and and just really try to implement an idea they have but they always this is my impression they, they're waiting for someone to come to come so they're a little bit like actors or people who are waiting and maybe they they um, and then they have to see how they get themselves and their ideas into these into these projects and um, I, I'm, I'm sure they're ex uh, people who do it the other way around, but it doesn't seem to be very, very common. Yeah, that's that's strange. And so I I could imagine I c I see it. This is maybe why why I came up with actors um, because a lot of actors now in Germany are doing their own films because they don't want to wait anymore uh, and think it's it's better to do their own own thing uh, and just yeah, and they're pretty successful in doing so. So. I think could be a thing for architects too. Okay. So, Nicholas? Um, so how, how do I uh, uh, react to the writer's brief? Um, of course, uh, according to your logic, Ingo, I was very, or we were very thankful for having a brief, because <laughs> obviously we, we are nothing without brief. But at the same time, uh, of course, we had to rewrite the brief. So we were given something from a writer, mm -hmm. but the typical thing, of course, for architects is that the writer or the client, in that case, you are my client, um, writes a text. And um, But of course, for us, this text is only a pretext to do something else. And, and also by like reading Ingo's text also, I think, became also clear for me in some way what this, what your advantage also is mm -hmm. a bit, like writing a text and this, that a text that is both precise and speculative. And we were kind of approaching this, um, 
theme, I think probably on in, in two ways. One was really like trying to make it real with a structural engineer, with all the uh, the tools we have. And but this is was of course also a very uh, um, scary moment. Like, do you really want to make it real? And I think that explains a bit um, this other interest we had in this, or probably the main interest in that project was to rewrite the debrief in a sense that it actually uh, adds another component to the issue of death, i.e. aging, which actually extends the project, I think, completely and also integrates different areas of um, or different spaces actually different experiences and that's probably also in my case very much a kind of autobiographical moment also like because I have experienced um, like in the social service like through one and a half years really uh, an urban the strongest urban experience I ever had probably and then um, Ingo also had a kind of we did an interview in front of the this memorial I did uh, in Frankfurt. So in some way, I wasn't particularly shocked by the text because mm. the text is also quite straightforward. It doesn't really invent very much, but it kind of writes existing writes about existing phenomena and writes it down and, and starts a speculation on it. But... Um, being quite familiar to uh, actually death as a building brief, I wasn't particularly shocked by it. Um, what I find really surprising is that uh, Ingo's text is actually is a writer's text, but it's very abstract. Mm. Uh, it's not very anecdotal. It's a, it's a really abstract consideration, whereas uh, three of the um, uh, architectural proposals, uh, sorry, Three of the architectural proposals uh, for me use a liter lit literary um, uh, tradition, yeah. that of the transition by Chiaron into yeah. the Hades, which is like a lit literature, mm. um, an allegorical yeah. um, topos. Yeah? And um, so I, I think that's really interesting that you kind of introduce literature into this project. Yeah. It's know. a classical topoi, uh, architects as bad writers. <laughs> so... <laughs> Are there any more questions? But you're, you're right. Uh, uh, this would be for Nicholas. Uh, I, I'm intrigued by the kind of solution that you would have for the architectural problem that I'm finding in, in your proposal because in a way when you are showing your drawings of the, of the proposal, you're always defining very well the, py the pyramid as uh, very uh, recognizable, very uh, symbolical, mm. uh, very uh, self-contained shape. But in the end, uh, you're talking that you're going to have an endless shape, a shape that is evolving, that is growing, that is not defined. So I wonder how you are able to, to work with this kind of informality of the things that are growing all the time, ongoing, and this kind of very well-defined symbolic, uh, symbolical aspect of the pyramid. I think that was the, uh, maybe what we were interested in was to take the uh, idea of the, of the pyramid quite literally. So this was something we, um, and I think Bingo, Ingo and, and myself, we had a couple of discussions also about the shape, I think that was also mm. for you, I think, uh, an issue. Is the pyramid the only volume that actually represents the, the idea? Certainly not, but I think it's a, it's, um, it's a volume that I think we were interested to uh, take the, the volume and the idea of the, and the sh geometry of the pyramid in a quite blunt and direct way and to combine this with process, with growth.
which actually um, you might remember this uh, the scheme, this onion scheme. So it's so it's you are layering the pyramid. So it will it will never be a perfect pyramid because it will it will grow, but you will always have a feeling or you will perceive that it's meant to be a pyramid, but it will never be perfect in its geometry. And uh, I think it goes back, of course, to uh, the historical evolution of the pyramid. And if you look at the first pyramids, there were steps. Yeah, and only after a while, they, 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 the shape came, became more and more precise. And uh, I think we were interested in this uh, imprecision in the process. But the recognizability of the pyramid was something we were taking, I think, in the sense of, of Schumann's question also, we were taking it quite directly as a brief. So in that respect, uh, I've never really questioned this idea um, because I think that was part of, of, uh, of the brief and of the text. And to, to step away from, from the pyramid as an idea I think would have broadened the the discussion in a strange way. So I think was was um, I think was more efficient to to stay with the idea of and the geometry of the pyramid. Mm. 